Well, again, welcome to church. Again, if you're new with us, my name is Bill. I am the teaching pastor, and we are close to being done with this series. We have this week and next week. We're going to talk about gentleness this week and self-control next week. So be self-controlled and get yourself to church next week because you're not going to want to miss it. Um, After that, we're going to do a short three-week series leading up to Easter Sunday, and that short three-week series is called Famous Last Words, and we are going to look at some of the things that Jesus said while hanging on the cross. Truly incredible. What would you say if you were hanging on the cross after being tortured? What Jesus said was incredible. And then the Sunday immediately following Easter, we're going to launch into something that I am very excited about. I hope you guys are excited about. We are going to launch into a series called Heaven. And we are going to be looking at what heaven is like from a biblical perspective. Now, there's a million books out there on heaven, and there's a million books out out there of people who said that they have died and gone to heaven. So we're going to wade through all of that, and we're going to get to the truth, and it's going to be awesome. Are you guys excited? Awesome. I hope you are. Get word out. Uh, Get word out about Easter and invite people to come. It's going to be awesome. Again, we are in the middle of this series. We're coming to the end of it, and we've based it off one verse, and we've been going word by word through that verse. We're not even going verse by verse through the Bible. We're going word through word, and it is Galatians 5, 22, and 23. Of course, we're memorizing it together the best we can. So you guys ready to say it? Here we go. Say it with me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you guys feel like you're getting it? Again, some of you got it week one. Others, are, others of you are like me, and it's, you're going to stumble and bumble your way through it for the rest of your life. That's fine. Uh, as long as you, know, you kind of know where it is and you know what it says, the Holy Spirit will use that when appropriate in your life. Of course, I'm taking a word away each week. We're talking about gentleness, so I left it up there. I left love as well. So say it with me, church. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, bravery, faithfulness, gentleness, and Awesome. You guys sound so awesome. Of course, this morning we come to the second to the last of the fruits of the Spirit, and that is gentleness. That is gentleness. And this is a tough one for me because, honestly, I sometimes struggle to be gentle. I know that's hard to believe. Gentle, sweet Bill, right? Right? <laughs> Ask anyone on staff. Yeah, Chris is down here who's on staff. He's laughing. Ask anyone on staff. Ask anyone in my own family. I have my moments where I lack gentleness. And you know why I do that? Because in those moments, the flesh takes over. And I don't care who you are and how mild-mannered you are and how nice you are. We all have those moments where we lose it, right? Why are you looking with a judging eye at me? Come on. You're all guilty of it too. You know you are. I know I'm not the only one. My flesh takes over in those moments. My flesh gets the better of me and I just, I lose it. And I hate it when I fail to be gentle. I really do. I hate it. And I know when I fail and I know that I see it, I can see it in the people that I'm talking to. They're crushed in spirit. And I'm like, I'm the one that crushed you. I am sorry. I am so sorry. Author Max Lucado, he said this, I can just finish with this, with this quote today. That's how powerful this is. Church, listen to this quote. If I raise my voice, may it only be in praise. If I clench my fist, may it only be in prayer. If I make a demand, may it only be of myself. I don't even have to preach after that, do I? I literally read that quote and I said, I don't even have to preach. I could just read that quote and send us all home. Unfortunately for you guys, I like to preach, so. (laughs) Such a powerful quote. You want to know when I struggle to be gentle? It's usually when one of three things are going on in my life. And it's one of these three things. When I'm trying to get my way, when I'm trying to get what I want, and this is a big one, when I'm trying to get my point across. Amen? Amen? Do you all struggle in one of those areas? Some of you struggle in all three areas, right? We all do. We all do, especially the last one, right? Getting my point across. How many of you know someone who, when they want to get their point across, take the gloves off, right? They become a bull in a china shop. I am going to get my point across. You are going to get it, and I'm going to run you over if I have to do it. Now, I don't want you to raise hands or point to anyone in the congregation. You're like, oh, yeah, that person's right over there. It's funny that you mention it. But we all know, and we've all been in those situations where we want to get our point across, and by George, I'm going to get my point across. You know, what's interesting, at least for me, and I don't know about you guys, I'm often least gentle with those that I love the most. Do you ever struggle with that? 
I'm often least gentle with those that I love the most. And I know that's not true for everyone in here, because some of you are more righteous than I, but I struggle with it. I really do. And maybe that's because I take for granted the people I love. And I just trust that my wife and my kids and those that are on staff are going to forgive me when I choose to, to run roughshod over them. Puritan leader Jonathan Edwards, he said this, gentleness was at the very heart of the Christian faith. It was the essence of the Christian spirit. That's what he said. Fascinating. The greatest preacher, by the way, uh, in America, um, England's greatest preacher, the Prince of Preachers was Charles Spurgeon. America's greatest preacher that it ever produced was Jonathan Edwards. And he said it was the very essence of the Christian faith. Of course, the Bible makes it very clear that God himself is amazingly tender-hearted and gentle toward you and to, toward me. And there's so many verses, but let me just read one. This is out of Isaiah. He, that is God, will tend his flock like a shepherd. He's a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. And he will gather the lambs in his arms. Beautiful picture. And he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Of course, Jesus his own life was marked by amazing gentleness. We just, Greg just had us repeat this with him when he was up on stage. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am, say it with me, I am gentle. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Folks, at the heart of the gospel is a God who is amazingly kind and tremendously gentle towards a people that don't deserve it. You understand this is the gospel. The gospel isn't God owes us something. The gospel is God owes us nothing and yet has given us everything. He has sent his one and only son into the world to die for people that didn't deserve it, you and me, and that whoever would turn in repentant faith and trust in Christ will be forgiven. This is the heart of the gospel, a God that should have given us justice but has given us gentleness. Think about that. A God that should have given us justice has given us gentleness. Praise God. God, for his tender-hearted, gentle nature towards you and me. God is so gentle that he will receive even the most wayward of people. It doesn't matter what you've done, how bad you've messed up, or how big those sins might be. If you will turn to Christ, again, with a repentant faith, trusting in him, he will receive you. He will receive any and all that turn to him in this way. And folks, here is the heart of it. The gentleness that God has shown to us is the gentleness he wants to produce through us. Jesus is both the lion and the lamb. He is both strong and gentle. And likewise, we, as his children in this world, are going to be strong and gentle. We are going to be strong with the gospel, but tender with sinners. We're going to be strong and gentle. You know what's interesting? After Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples started planting churches all around the Roman Empire. But here's what's interesting. As they went forth, they went forth not lording it over people, but in a spirit of gentleness. See, they were thinking just the opposite of the way the world thinks. The world says, if you want to get to the top of the ladder, what do you do? You're ruthless. It's a cutthroat world, right? Fight your way to the top. Knock people down if you have to. Whatever it takes, get to the top. But in the kingdom of heaven, up is down, down is up, right? The disciples went forth, not lording it over people, not in strength and power, their own strength and power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, with a gentle, gentle, tender heart, they planted churches and won people to Christ. It is truly fascinating that they did this. Take, for example, the Apostle Paul. As a leader in the early church, he preferred to conduct his ministry not with an iron fist, but with a tender heart. He wrote the Corinthians and he said this, church, hear the word of God this morning. Hear the word of God. This is the apostle Paul who had all the authority in the world. He wrote this, by the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I appeal to you by the humility and gentleness of Christ. I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face, but bold toward you when you're away. And then he says this, I beg you, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect. He didn't want to have to be bold and be strong and firm with them. He wanted to be gentle and tender. And he says this, towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Paul's default position was always one of gentleness. As a leader in the church, he preferred the role of gentle shepherd over all others. Now, this is very important, what I'm about to say. And some of you in here need to hear this, not all of you. But some of you need to hear what I'm about to say. 
Paul preferred to be gentle, but there were times in which he had to crack the whip with people. Paul even warns the Corinthians in his first letter to them. He says this, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? He says, the choice is yours. But as you mess around with sin and as you do the things that you're doing, as you're acting wayward, my goal is to come to you in a gentle spirit, but I might have to come with a rod. This is similar to when Jesus cleared the temple. You will remember that Jesus made a whip and drove out the money changers. Although Jesus was truly gentle in heart, there were times in which he had to crack the whip. Now, here's why I say that. And that's why I say it's, this isn't for everybody in this room. It's just for some of you. The reason I say this is because sometimes in the name of gentleness, we as Christians are excessively passive and docile towards those in our life who are out of control. Let me say that again. I say this because sometimes in the name of gentleness, we are excessively passive and docile towards those that are out of control in our lives. Let me give you an example. As a parent and a grandparent, which many of us in here are, if our kids or grandkids get out of line, there comes a time where godly discipline is required. There is a time in which we are to be the lion, and there are times in which we are to be the lamb. There are times in which we are to roar, and there are times in which we are to be gentle. And you don't do those in your life any favor who are out of control when you should be roaring, but you're treating them with, in the name of gentleness too passive, and you're too docile. And I said, some of you don't need to hear that because some of you, when somebody gets out of line and somebody, a a kid or a grandkid is out of control, you're firm with them and you know this principle, but others of us struggle with it. It's like, I don't want to have to be firm with them. I don't want to have to say hard things and be bold. But Jesus, he knew when it was time to be bold. Paul, he knew when it was time to be bold. And although our default position is always one of gentleness, there are times, folks, in which it is okay to be bold. Amen? You know who you are out there. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but you know who you are. It is okay to draw boundaries. It is okay as Christians to be firm and to say no or to say wake up or to stop it. Again, it's always our desire to be gentle, but sometimes, just like in the case of Jesus and just like in the case of Paul, godly discipline is required. There comes a time in which we need to crack the whip. Don't ever feel guilty for doing that. But this brings us back to the point, folks, the big point. The gentleness that God has shown to us is the gentleness he wants to produce through us. Now, let me ask you, when you hear the word gentle, what comes to your mind? Do you know what came to the Apostle Paul's mind? This is what came to his mind as he wrote to the Christians in in Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 2.7, listen to this. But we were gentle among you, like, this is a simile, remember high school English? Your love is like a red, red rose, right? We are gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Folks, what a powerful image of what it means to be gentle, a nursing mother caring for her own children. I don't know the last time you held a newborn infant, but when you hold a newborn infant, one of the best words to describe that experience is what? Gentle, right? Just out of curiosity, who has held a newborn infant in the last month? How many of you it's been a year or more? How many of you it's been five years or more? (laughs) How many of you haven't held a newborn infant in like 30 years? Yeah, (laughs) it's been a while, right? For me, my wife loves holding newborn infants, but if she has a newborn infant, she literally has to force that child on me to get me to take it, right? It's like, no, 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 I'm fine. And it's not that I'm even afraid to change the diaper or any of that. It's just like, I don't want to hold him because I'm scared, right? And she literally has to force the baby in my arms. And I'm like, ah. And I'm like, trying not to breathe too heavy, and I'm trying not to walk too... Uh, you know how it is, right? You know exactly how it is. And I think it's no coincidence that Paul uses this analogy to describe what it means to be gentle. Holding a newborn infant is one of the most gentle things you will ever do in this lifetime. Even the biggest, most burly man will act in utter tenderness and care when holding a newborn infant. You know, men like me.
The humor is in that I'm so skinny. And <laughs> Here's the point. Don't, don't miss what I'm about to say. If only, if only I would approach all of my relationship with the same mindset as I do when holding a newborn infant, a mindset of utter and complete gentleness. If I did that, just imagine the impact I would have. Imagine the impact that you would have if you approached every one of the relationships you are in as if you were holding a newborn infant. This is how Paul was with the early church. He was gentle among them, like a nursing mother caring for her children. Let me ask you, are you gentle with those that God has put into your life as a nursing mother caring for her children? Now, this is very important, what I'm about to say, and here it is. We tend to be most gentle with that which we most value. Amen? We do. And I know this because it's true in my own life. Let me prove it to you. I drive a very classy, prestigious car. God has blessed me with a Honda Civic. <laughs> and I value that car because it gives me freedom and it allows me to do a lot of ministry. And so I like to be gentle with it and take really good care of it. And so... Whenever my kids are in my car and they get out of the car, I say, don't slam the door. Don't slam the trunk. And I have teenage boys that are full of testosterone. And when they close the door, they're like the Incredible Hulk. They're like, Yuck. I can feel every nut and bolt in my car rattle. <laughs> and you know the modern day trunks, they close real easy, right? So my kids are, you know, he'll, my son will get his baseball stuff out of there. And it's like both hands as hard. Yuck. I'm like, don't slam the, and I always say it too late. You know how you always say it too late? It's like, don't slam the, too late. And when I park my car, guess where I park it? I park it where it won't get door dings. You do the same thing, don't you? When you pulled into church this morning, do you look at the cars you're parking next to and going, are they worthy of my car being parked next to it? You know you do. <laughs> is this a worthy vehicle? And is this a worthy driver? for me to park my blessed vehicle next to. And don't, ever, don't even get me started about when I go over, right, speed bumps. What do you do when you go over speed bumps? We slow down and we're like, ooh, 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 right? Nice and slow because we don't want to bottom out the car because the car is precious to me. It is valuable to me. But folks, you want to know what concerns me the most. In all seriousness, let this resonate with you. What concerns me the most is I can often be more gentle towards the things I own than the people that God has put into my life. I will often be more gentle towards the things I own than the people that God has put into my life. Folks, there are times when I truly think I am more gentle, and this isn't a joke. There are times when I truly think I am more gentle towards my Honda Civic than I am my own family. And that concerns me. That breaks my heart. But I know I'm not alone in this. Men, let me speak to the men just for a second. I believe that there are a lot of men who are more gentle and caring towards the things they own than the wife they married. Let me just let that sit on you for a second, men. Women, this is for you. I'm going to bat for you on this one. I truly believe there are a lot of men who are more gentle and caring towards the things they own than the woman that they married. But it's not just a problem that men have. Women can fall into this trap too. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I would rather be in the middle of a street fight with 12 men than in a fight with two women. <laughs> right? Because when two women go to fight, the word gentle is not anywhere near there. You run for the hills. It's not just a problem that men have. It is a problem that women have too. Folks, heaven forbid, the Lord forbid that I am more gentle towards the things I own than the people that God has put into my life. If only I would approach all of my relationship with the same, all of my relationships with the same mindset as I do when holding a newborn infant, a mindset of utter and complete gentleness. If I did that, imagine the impact I would have. If you did that, imagine the impact that you would have. By the way, it's really interesting to me, the Bible is full of uh, verses about wisdom. As a matter of fact, the whole book of Proverbs is, this is what a wise man is, this is what a wise woman is. But all throughout the Bible, there's verses that says, do you want to know if you're wise? This is a truly wise person. 
James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, he wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, and say it with me, and gentle, and gentle. It's reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Do you want to know when you're being truly wise? It's when you're being truly gentle. Your flesh is going to tell you the opposite. The world is going to tell you the opposite. It's going to say true wisdom fights for its rights. True wisdom pushes people aside. True wisdom, a person who's truly wise, runs over people to get their point across. But in the kingdom, in God's kingdom, up is down and down is up. If you want to be truly wise, you will proceed in a spirit of gentleness. Who would have thought? And this verse is so true, is it not? People who are wise in their own eyes are often arrogant. And arrogant people are rarely known for their gentleness. I can ask you right now, who is the most, don't say anything, who's the most arrogant person you know? I bet you the word gentleness, you don't associate gentleness with that person. I almost guarantee you, you do not associate gentleness with that person. By the way, the the Greek word for gentle was often used of a wild horse that had been broken and made useful for its master. It is basically power under control. It's strength with sensitivity. Listen, we have to be, as Christians, we have to be strong in this world. There's times we have to be the lion, and it's okay. But we need to know those times when we need to be the lamb. We need to be gentle. Our Savior was the lion and the lamb, and he's the only true lion and lamb. But I'm just saying, as we proceed in this life, there are times in which we have to be strong, and we should be strong, and you make no excuses for being strong. But it is always our desire, whenever possible, to proceed in a spirit of gentleness, I love the way the Apostle Paul said it to the Ephesians. He says, be kind to one another. And then he uses this word, tenderhearted. Be tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as as God in Christ forgave you. I love this word, tender heart. Tender heart. If I can be so bold as to ask you this morning, would the people you know best, that know you best, describe you as a person with a tender heart? You know, so often I think when people think of me, they're going to, you know, that know me the best would go, there's a part of Bill's heart that's a bit calloused. And I, I, and that concerns me because I want to be known as a man with a tender heart. By the way, it wasn't just the apostle Paul that used this word tender heart. Peter said it when he said this in 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Again, folks, it is fascinating to me that the first apostles commissioned by the Lord himself, although they had all the authority in the world, always exercised their authority in a spirit of gentleness. They could have ruled with an iron fist, but they didn't because their Savior didn't. And by the way, that becomes the standard for anyone who is a church leader. You know what you should demand of your church leaders? Gentleness. It's gentleness. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponent, say it with me, with gentleness. Whenever you have an opportunity to hire a staff person or somebody in the pulpit or a worship leader, one of the key characteristics you should be looking for is gentleness. Do not hire somebody who's going to rule with an iron fist. Too many churches have, and too many churches have been ruined with people, with men who have gotten to power and have ruled with an iron fist. Don't ever let that happen. Don't ever let it happen at this church or whatever church you end up at. Look for a tender heart. If it's not there, that's not the man for you. And it says this, that God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. By the way, I don't know about you, but when people oppose me, correcting his opponents with gentleness, when people stand up to oppose the gospel I'm preaching or get in my face, the last thing I want to be is gentle, right? I want to take my KGB Bible and whack them over the head as hard as I can. Get the spirit of God in you, you know, and just, you know, hit him as hard as I can. The biggest, fattest KGB, King James Version Bible that I have. But no, I'm to, to, I'm to proceed with gentleness. Peter said it this way, always be, pre- pre- <laughs> always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Do this with gentleness and respect. As Christians, it is not our desire to mow people over with the truths of the Bible, Rather, we're gentle and tenderhearted, especially towards those who don't yet see the truth. Listen, those that oppose us, they live in a world where they're constantly being opposed. 
And so when they start arguing with Christians, they're expecting us as Christians to act like everybody else in the world. But then they run into Christians like us and they go, wait a minute, you're not like everybody else in the world. I oppose you, but you're gentle. I stand up in your face and you're tenderhearted. Who are you? And why do you do this? I am a Christian and I follow Christ who is gentle and lowly at heart and I invite you to come to know him and to experience him. Folks, when you are out, out in the world and you are running into people that are opposing you, be gentle and tender at heart. Be gentle with them as people were gentle with you when you didn't understand the truth. Now, let me get to the final thing that we're going to talk about today. Here is the number one way in which Christians are going to struggle with being gentle. Can you guess what it is? Just think about it for a moment. What is the number one way that you struggle perhaps with being gentle? This isn't true for everybody, but I think it's true for most of us. If ever there were a time in which Christians, we as Christians are going to be tempted to be harsh, critical, and overbearing, it is when the people that God has put into our life mess up and fail us. The Apostle Paul wrote this, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, in other words, if somebody around you is messed up, it doesn't just have to be a moral sin. It could be they could mess up in any type of way. If someone around you is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person. Say it with me. Gently. Gently. On cue, that phone rang. That was perfect. <laughs> it's okay, whoever's phone it is. I, I always make sure my phone's off. It's all, I, I, I've had it happen. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Let's be honest here. It is easy to want to throw stones at those who mess up, or to be harsh with someone who has stumbled in some way or another, especially when that person is a family member or somebody close to us. Often when I hear that somebody around me has messed up, you know what my first thought is? What an idiot. Don't judge me. You think the same thing. <laughs> I'm like, how stupid can that person be? I hope they get what they deserve. And whatever they do, they better not come to me because there ain't no mercy here, right? <laughs> come on, you think the same way. When someone messes up, my first reaction is often a harsh reaction. And that's a confession. My first reaction is often a harsh reaction. Why? Because that is my flesh. That is what I've been trained to do. That is what the world has taught me. You're an idiot. Why did you do that? And I tend to be more harsh with those that are further away from me. When I see somebody that has failed on the news, you think I'm harsh with those that have failed in my life. When they're far away from me and I see them on the news... You should hear me in my car. You know, if I'm driving and I hear so-and-so messed up, whoa, I just start waxing eloquent and condemnation is flowing out of my car all over the radio. <laughs> Folks, if ever there were a time, if ever there were a time, how ironic that that just happened. <laughs> and nobody messed up. That's just the, the wire here. If ever there were a time in which someone needed a gentle hand, it is when they come to you and say, I have messed up. I have messed up. And everyone in this room has people in their lives who have messed up. And maybe they have come to you, maybe they haven't, but they have messed up. It might be a family member, a grandchild, a child, a nephew, a niece, but we all have those people in our lives who have messed up. The question is when they come to you, you who are a believer in Christ, you who have been transformed by the grace and tender-hearted nature of God, what do they find? What do they experience? And again, it doesn't have to be some huge moral failure. People let us down in all sorts of ways. People can fail us, and in those moments, we have a decision to make. Shall I be harsh, or shall I be tender-hearted? Folks, if ever there were a people that should show gentleness in such moments, it's we who are Christians. After all, no one has known gentleness on a grander scale than you and me. But I want you to notice what this passage says. It says, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. When someone in your life has messed up, be careful because there are a thousand and one ways in which you can stumble in that moment, not the least of which is falling into the temptation of being overly harsh and uncompassionate in that moment. I do it all the time. I started with this quote right here. If I raise my voice, may it only be in praise. If I clench my fist, may it only be in prayer. If I make a demand, may it only be of myself. Philippians 4, 5 says, let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Is Linda Olson in here? Is Linda in here? She's not in here. If you don't know who, oh, there she is. Linda, everybody turn, Linda, stand up. I need you to stand up. 
Everybody just say, give her a round of applause, and I'll tell you why in a minute. <laughs> Linda runs our, basically our care and compassion ministry. She is always hooking up people who are able to come alongside those that are in the hospital or in a place where they need just somebody in, an old, in a retirement home, somebody that's looking for a friend. You want to know a practical application to this message? She told me, she stopped in my office this week, and we were, no, that was last week, and we were talking. And she goes, Bill, she specifically said that. She goes, I need men. I need men. <laughs> she needs women, but she needs men to come along in the compassion ministry and go, go and visit people in homes, in the retirement homes or in the hospital, or people that just need somebody with a gentle heart and a tender hand. If that describes you and you have the time to do it, see that lady right there after this service because she will put you to work in a very simple way. One of the things I learned about my dad before he died, my dad was very, he held his religious cards very close to his hands, but one of the things he did was that there was a, a man, I never met the man, but he would visit this man on a weekly basis in a retirement home. He would go and spend time with him. My dad never said anything about it, but that's what he did. And that's an awesome way to put gentleness to work. So if I may be so bold, I'll end with this question. Is your gentleness on display at all times and in all ways? Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the tender-hearted care that you show towards us. And God, may we in a world that is very, very cruel and very, very brutal, God, be a people of gentleness. God, we all know people that have messed up, who have stumbled. We all have people that let us down. But God, in those moments, may we be a people of tender care. So Father, we love you. And we thank you. In the quietness of your heart, I just want you to spend one moment in private prayer. Ask God if there's anybody that you've been overly harsh with or critical towards. Ask God to forgive you and ask God to change your heart towards them. Amen. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray these things. And the church said... Amen. God bless you. We will see you right here next week. Make sure to get your church directories on the way out. God bless.